Jedi Amanda here to bring you another cosplay breakdown. Bow, bow, bow. Insert, breakdown. <laughs> insert theme music. <laughs> if you can't tell, today we're going to break down my Anastasia costume, or that my award-winning Anastasia costume. <laughs> so before we get to the whole look of the outfit, we need to go under this dress and see what is under all of this. With the power of editing, nim nah. And with the magic of editing, we are down to the innermost layer of Anastasia. And I wanted to show you guys the ground up on putting on Anastasia. And for that means, I have to show you her underwear or her historical thickness. <laughs> Ooh la la. Ooh la la. Anyways, um, this is the what's called the chemise. And the chemise is a historical garment that is worn underneath, basically it's your innermost layer um, that is the closest to your skin and it is what goes under uh, your stays or as some people know them as corsets when you wear historical garment wear. I made this chemise out of cotton muslin. It's very loose fitting and kind of wrinkle at the moment and I knew I needed to drape off of the shoulders for Anastasia because that's the design of the outfit. Um, so it's a simple drawstring, chest, neckline, chemise that is extremely loose. And I typically wear leggings underneath of my Anastasia outfit because I do sweat a lot and that's what the chemise picks up and that's what the leggings pick up. So for this matter, I'm showing you the chemise. I used a very simple pattern from, I believe it was Simplicity. McCall, Simplicity, Butterick, they have tons and different of chemise, tons different chemise patterns if you're interested in making one for yourself. They are super simple, it took me probably about an hour to cut and make. But this is a very important layer when you are wearing historical stays or any kind of corset, um, <clears throat> body structured garment underneath ball gowns or any kind of historical uh, garment. Very, very, very needed layer. The shoes. Now we have layer number two, which is my stays. Are my stays? Is my stays? I'm not sure the exact definition, but anyways, I did make these. These are um, historical stays. Or um, from the pattern that I used from Truly Victorian. I have the links below if you're interested in making this exact pattern. It's the Silverado pattern. Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry. It's from Laughing Moon. Not Truly Victorian. Laughing Moon's Silverado 1870s, I think, stays pattern. I'm really unprepared for talking about the stays. But this is a absolute must if you are wearing ball gowns or any kind of outfit that you need to have structured. I highly suggest you make yourself a pair of stays. Um, I used twill with steel boning. You can also use uh, whalebone or you can use zip ties actually within your um, stays garment corset thing. It's a complete uh, corset back and then it wraps around the front and ties. These are shoestring Two string ties that I use for this and simple cotton muslin for the binding. The inside is Star Wars fabric though, <laughs> and it's really cute. It's actually bedding fabric that's Empire Strikes Back. I know it's super cute, but this is actually the first thing I made for my Anastasia outfit. And it was pretty easy to put together. If you've never put together a corset or stays in that matter, um, they're pretty straightforward, paneled garment, sew it up, bind it and call it a day. But this is an absolute must, must for me to get the structure and the look of the Anastasia gown that I designed. And therefore it's the second most inner layer of my Anastasia outfit. The next layer of Anastasia's is the crinoline slash hoop skirt. It looks really short on this mannequin because it's measured to my length, not hers, so it's not supposed to be that far off the ground. Just an FYI. <laughs> she has legs for days. She has legs for days. Um, 
and uh, please ignore the safety pin. But anyways, this is a the elliptic crinoline hoop skirt pattern from Truly Victorian that once again I will link the pattern link below in the description if you would like to make it. It is my it was my very first hoop skirt that I made myself and um, it actually wasn't too bad. It was kind of mind-blowing to look at it um, as a whole uh, but it went together fairly simple. Um, I chose the elliptical look because I needed a party in the back, slim in the front kind of look. I didn't necessarily want to go with a traditional A-line crinoline or a Civil War ball gown. This is more of a uh, late 19th century look um, for the design that I made for Anastasia. So that's why it's a little slimmer in the front and on the back it is much more bulbous and kind of gives her a bit of a bustle look. Um, there's a big hump in the back and it drapes down much easier through uh, through that. It also helps distribute a lot of weight because this dress is really heavy. The crinoline is created from ribbon, steel boning, uh, twill bias tape, and twill fabric that I did get exclusively online all through Twilio Victorian's website. And the cool thing about it is when you buy through that website they actually link you every single thing you need for the pattern. Um, in a really simple package you can buy. So they give you the right amount of boning, they give you the right amount of, of, of fabric and the right amount of ribbon that you have to buy or that you can buy through them. It's really simple. I highly suggest that website for any kind of historical undergarment wear. It's truly awesome. <clears throat> now the next layer is the petticoat. organza petticoat that was a lot of work um i knew i needed a petticoat well of course i needed a petticoat for a ball gown but i needed something with a lot of girth i guess is the only term that i'm coming up with um because the dress is so heavy i needed a lot of layers to be able to poof it out to give at least somewhat of a princessy look uh this is a um three-tiered gathered petticoat that Salem loves to get under. <laughs> um, once again, this is a petticoat that is for my length, not for the model mannequin length, so that's why it's so short on the mannequin, but it is nine layers of alternating gold and yellow poly organza. And I believe I bought 40 yards of, of poly organza to make out of this, and I used about half I think. Um, it's just gathered tiered layers with a gathered gathered uh, bottom edge and everything is surged together and everything is just gathered together. I don't know what other, what other term is this. I do have the bottom hem <clears throat> of all the layers bound with um, a specific hem tape called a Hug and Snug. There we go. And it is a awesome by the roll polyester hem tape that you can buy. That is a great option for binding the edges of chiffon or organza for petticoats and any kind of underlayer like this. I use this stuff for a lot of things. The back is held together with two uh, hook and bars, dress hook and bars. So it's the big, the big ones. And then it's all just gathered within this waistband that is yellow satin that is heavily interfaced to keep this all up. And I will say by the time the last layer of skirt layer is over, my waist is getting pretty, pretty bogged down. Um, however, the petticoat and the crinoline do help distribute the weight for this crazy Anastasia gown. <laughs>
This is my original design, Anastasia, from the 1997 animated feature Anastasia costume. This is a ball gown that is based off of her final gown, the one she wears at the end of the movie, in the yellow gold pink monstrosity that I actually really did not like. <laughs> I thought it was hideous. And I really liked that movie, and I kind of wanted to do a princess glitzy over-the-top glam gown for a competition for me, and I was like, why don't I redesign something that I actually really didn't like? And that was her dress. So, <clears throat> here it is. I did do the design on this, and I would say it's more of a redesign and kind of a rethinking, a reimagining, more than an actual from the cuff original design. So like I said, this is a reimagining more than an original design. However, I did design a lot with this. So I will say I'd use the same tones and aesthetic, but I kind of fluffed her out a bit. Um, the gown in the movie is very A-line. I added a elliptical crinoline with a train, and so it's more elliptical, I guess I would say, and <clears throat> versus the one in the movie that is just straight A-line. And I um, <clears throat> redesigned all of the embroidery pieces that went down the front and uh, the border of the dress to be more historically accurate. I ended up finding this um, tulip image actually from a dress um, that was act that was in a uh, Russian historical portrait. And so I found this image and I kind of retooled it on Illustrator and then pushed it to an embroiderer and um, actually made the embroidery. We'll go over the patches once we get into the detail um, in a second. So. First things I want to talk about are the fabric. This entire outfit is basically two types of fabric. It's upholstery fabric, once again, upholstery fabric for the win, and Silk Dupioni from Silk Baron, which is my absolute favorite fabric website online. I love them. They are fantastic. They have the widest range of silks and handmade fabrics that anybody can um, on the internet. I, it, it's fantastic. So I went with this color, I think it's their Hollywood color, um, Silk Du Peony, and the, this fabric and all through the, the border and the outside is the cream from Silk Baron and Silk Du Peony. This is also Silk Taffeta, and I think it's their color called Nantucket. Um, I went with Taffeta because I needed something that pressed extremely well for the sash, and this presses like a dream, I oh, love it. And uh, once again, yeah, Hollywood's right through here. Now this is a base fabric that is upholstery fabric that my awesome friends Casey Renee and Sarah from Luna Rose Cosplay came through and found this fabric for me at that magical Atlanta warehouse that got all my Doctor Strange fabric. That place is magic. Still haven't seen it, but it was magic. And they got this on a roll. I said I really liked it. I wanted a gold brocade, but I didn't want the brocade to be super, how can I say? Um, in your face. It needed to be very subtle and I just thought this was perfect and I added basically it came to me very very stiff. I threw it into the uh, washing machine with a lot of fabric softener and it made it super soft and nice. Still heavy as all, he as all hell but it's nice now. So that is the outer fabric. Yeah that is it for the fabric. So let's talk about um, all the detailing and trim. So, we'll talk about the patches first. So these actually are patches. I embroidered these with my embroidery machine, very similar to how I created the patch, or the embroidery design for Doctor Strange's cloak, except this I just ended up cutting out and putting on um, heat and bond, which is, excuse me, a basically sheet of glue that you can put on the back of fabric and iron onto another fabric and get it to adhere. Um, that is how all of this is stuck to the inside border. Around the patch is gold trim that I couched down using that couching method that I showed you guys in the Doctor Strange video. All the way around the outside just to give it that extra punch. And of course what you're seeing is all of the bling. All of the bling is Precosa rhinestones that I got from beadsfactory.com. I ended up hand gluing all of these. I did not use the hotfix. I don't like how that goes on. I don't 
think the adhesion is as good. And so I use a glue called Gym Tac, and it's the best glue ever. I actually used to be a bedazzler when college um, throughout two summers. I professionally bedazzled horsemanship jackets. It was pretty cool. <laughs> but that's where I learned all of my um, technique with bedazzling. There is a science to it, weirdly. And these are the colors Topaz and Magenta, I think. I don't quite remember what colors I use. Um, as well with the colored rhinestones, I used Crystal AB rhinestones for the center portion of the gown and the front part of the bodice, I think. Yep, and it's all glued down by hand. And I also made Alex do some of this front too. Yeah, you did sweatshop style. I did sweatshop style. You come over to my house, I feed you and I put you to work. True story. <laughs> true story. True story. The outside is gold piping that I created from gold bias trim with pipe. <laughs> and there is all of this um, trim. This is regular trim. Regular trim. It's crazy gaudy trim that I got from Joann's that I actually dyed. It was cream. I didn't have, they didn't really have any golds that I really liked that didn't look tacky. So I dyed them with um, a chocolatey light brown, I think, and that's what the color came out to be for this front section trim. And the same for the bottom section trim. I dyed that too with, um, and I think I used poly dye because they are polyester trim. Over top of that are pearls that I got in various sizes. They're the halfback pearls, so they are able to glue flat to the outfit. I ended up, <laughs> for some odd reason, putting a whole bunch of hidden Mickeys in my outfit. Not any kind of Disney thing there, because this is not Disney, kind of now, I guess, since it's Fox. <laughs> um, all over this front, it's just a lot of this design of the detailing came very organically. I didn't really know what I was doing. I just kind of slapped some rhinestones on and put on what made sense. <laughs> That's kind of how that went. I mean. I don't really have, there was no method to the madness there. I just arranged these pearls and these rhinestones on the patches to the way I thought it looked the best. And sometimes that's how it works. Happy accidents. Happy little trees. Happy accidents. Um, Happy little Mickeys. Little Mickeys. This is some gold trim also from Joann's. I have steel boning all throughout this outfit. Oh, I completely forgot to tell you all how I made the outfit before I even started bedazzling it. Sorry, this whole outfit took six months, I think. Yeah, she took six months, so it was a lot of thinking. But I draped everything. I didn't use a pattern for the uh, bodice. I used a pattern for the skirt because there was a skirt pattern that came with the specific uh, elliptical crinoline from True Victorian, so I just bought that skirt fabric and I used it. But I did add in the train, so. <coughs> I did rework the pattern for the train. Um, and it is a five foot, four, four foot train. Four foot train? Four foot train, we're gonna go with four foot train. <laughs> I don't remember. It was a lot, it was a lot of time. Um, so yes, this whole bodice was draped, very kind of simple um, strapless gown style. And then this all was uh, draped with muslin that I figured out with some pins and tucks and here and there ended up getting that that sleeve border and then this was also draped with muslin please excuse the wrinkles sorry <laughs> but if you don't is... point them out they won't notice I know but I had to say I'm sorry <coughs> I just don't do wrinkles shut up <laughs> um, <clears throat> I don't really know what to call this sleeve. It's kind of like a sleeve overlay sleeve thing. I'm not sure, but I draped this also and um, added a whole bunch of trim. This is actually pearl tape, pearl beading that you can buy at Joann's along with this, this trim. Once again, Joann's came to me in a clutch and I used Crystal AB um, Precosa crystals all around the edge within all the little grooves of the trim for this also. The sash was something that I, once again, draped also, but I ended up kind of just pleating it where I thought it would look nice. I used a lot of historical 
um, photographs and portraits from the early 20th century uh, to get what royal sashes look like in there. And it's actually one big wide piece that's just pleated down um, to make it look however they want it. But this is <laughs> my little amulet accoutrement thing here. I don't know what to call it. Sash bejeweled fancy. I don't know. I thought I needed something there, so I made something. <laughs> it's a brooch that I actually am using clear warble on the back, and I glued rhinestones to it. So if you ever need to make a brooch for any kind of reason, clear warble actually comes through in a snap, or any kind of clear acrylic plastic that uh, glues well to anything else will work for you. And all you gotta do is just sew it to the back, or actually this is glued down. Yep. Okay, now welcome to the bottom of the dress. It's a whole new world down here. <laughs> Started from the bottom, now we're here. Bull, bull. <laughs> okay, let's talk about this border. This border is basically one giant piece of wallpaper <laughs> that I can fit under. Well, we're not gonna do that right now. We're gonna talk about it. These are, like I said, just like the tulip patterns at the top. I have them on the bottom, um, except they're just probably four times larger. I tried to use the same um, arrangement of rhinestones on the big ones, like I did the little ones, but you know, I had to space out as much as I could. These I actually, oh nope, I did patch those on too. I can't remember. They're just glued on extremely heavy. I think I used E6000 glue for that. E3000? E6000? I'm not sure. Um, so once I had all of these patches on, um, spatially how I wanted them, I added all of the pearls around to kind of fill in a lot of the dead space. And then also I use this store-bought Joann's rope uh, braid trim. I'm using the bead trim down here also, and this uh, piping that I made using gold bias tape. I made so much of this freaking gold piping, I still have some left, I don't even know what I'm gonna do. This is also um, hand-dyed polyester trim from Joann's that I believe I like this one came in a cream color and then on top of this trim i also have more pearls i stuck pearls everywhere on this freaking dress and throughout the bottom portion of this skirt actually throughout the whole skirt i have little clusters of crystal ab um rhinestones throughout just to give that extra push because why not extra you're already this far why not just take it to the next level on the bottom edge is the uh gold piping and it's kind of fraying a lot right now because this dress has been through a lot, a lot. but I just wanted to point out the fact that um, I did end up doing a pretty thick um, turned hem on this dress because it drags when I wear it and this thing gets dirty and so when you're making ball gowns you want to really think about the hem of your dress and understand the environment that you're going to be in so if you need to bulk up the underside of the dress do it you will actually um, be very thankful for it and it also adds a little bit of weight to the dress so it's not so billowy um, the worst thing is to have something snag while you're at a convention and your dress just rips that would be terrible last thing i want to talk about down here with the hem of the dress is this edge of the front panel um, the whole dress actually is a skirt and an overlay, um, I forgot to mention that, but I only bedazzled what would be shown. Before I forget, I wanted to point out my Kofi donators that helped me fund the rhinestones for this outfit. And they, and I, like I have for the Doctor Strange outfit, I wrote them on some canvas and hand sewed them to the inside of my dress. So if you donate to my Kofi account, shameless plug, you get incorporated into my dresses however I see fit. So the last thing I want to talk about this skirt is this front panel, um, the front pink panel thing. Uh, when I made this, it actually, the Silk Dupioni was really light and it billowed out in the front of my dress. Um, and it made this very strange shape because the back of the dress and the sides of the dress were so heavy, it pushed it everything front. And so I ended up having to weigh down the hem of my skirt with a chain, like a jewelry chain that I got, and it probably was the smartest idea I've ever had with this whole freaking outfit, because this lays down very nice, and it doesn't billow out to where it looks like it doesn't fit with the dress. 
So, and it cupped nicely when I walk. Um, it cups nicely underneath the petticoat. So everything actually makes freaking sense. You need functionality in your dresses, right? Yeah, totally. I don't think I'm gonna show you all how I did it because I can explain it, but throughout the convention, I can't have this train completely dragging the ground. So I made a five point bustle, a five point over bustle on the back of this dress to hold the train with some clear acrylic buttons. And basically I just have little loops that go on to the bustle that help keep the back part of the dress up, but does push the dress forward when I wear it, which kind of sucks. But it really helps in not completely trash the dress when I'm at a convention. But this whole dress has a big old five foot, four foot, however long train in the back. I could literally sleep under this dress and it'd probably be pretty comfortable. Okay, so now let's go back up to the top and talk about the crown and jewelry. So the last thing we're going to talk about with the dress is the wig and crown and jewelry. And these were the last things I made with the dress. This was actually graciously gifted to me by Goldberry Cosplay, I think, um, on Instagram. And it's her beautiful Together in Paris necklace that she wears. And I thought it was a cute little addition. Um, but uh, let's talk about the wig. The wig actually is completely... Um, human hair wig that I created with association with the company I work for, Custom Wig Company, shameless plug, go follow us on Instagram. I created it for the competition also, and it's for our stock at work. So it is an updo red wig that is completely hand tied human hair. I don't really have much to show about that because I did it at work. If you're interested in seeing more about how I made this wig and how we make our wigs, please go visit our Instagram and website. Dink. Links below. Okay, so let's talk about the crown. The crown is kind of like the cherry on the topping for this outfit because guess what? It lights up! <laughs> I know it's probably like severely white on the camera. Yeah, it's white. But that's okay. If you want some more in-depth looks of the crown and the different um, <clears throat> waves that it does in not, you know, when it's a little more focused on that, please check out my Instagram. I have plenty of videos on it. However, I'll give a short uh, description on how I made it right now. So the crown <coughs> is actually about, um, the depth of it is about three inches and sits on top of my head and is held with this giant, um, what is this called? Hair bread. <laughs> on a very thin um, headband. Weirdly, it balances quite well. I was shocked that this worked. <laughs> the whole thing was sketched out with paper that I just cut around and basically made a crown shape. That sounds so weird, but once you kind of develop the shape that you want with these prop pieces, it's very easy to actually get the look that you want. So. It is a, a three inch deep, two layered crown. On the outside is um, pearly warbler, and then there is a section on the inside that is hollow that two battery packs actually sit down, and that is what's basically making the whole crown light up. Um, I'm using fairy lights. Uh, I use fairy lights in a lot of my outfits. They're very simple lighting uh, utility piece that you can easily incorporate into costumes. Um, it is heavy, I'm not gonna lie, and it does hurt my head after a while, but hey, it shines like a diamond, so that's what I wanted. And in the movie, it has this weird disco-y ball technical or techno look, um, that's 90s animation for you, that I wanted to nail and make it look exactly like it stepped out of the movie, um, instead of just a bejeweled crown. Just to go that step, one step further, because, you know, extra. All of the crystals on the outside are actually chandelier crystals that I got on Amazon. I got all of them for like 20 bucks. It was pretty cool. Um, they do have little holes on each side of the crystal to make, you know, if you're, you know, DIYing your chandelier, you can buy these. However, I wanted them completely see-through because I knew the, the lights were going to be on the back side and these needed to glow uh, like a diamond, per se. And all of these are held on by hot glue and some are held on by super glue. Um, in between each crystal is a pearl, just to fill in some more space. Um, I did poke through uh, craft foam on the back side of that with the warbler, and that is what the um, lights are poking through, is craft foam. 
And then all around the outside is the rest of the beading pearl tape. And then I have some gold piping down here. And then on top is another row of the extra crystals that I had completely chained together with um, some jewelry wiring. And then on the back side is this extra fabric um, to bring it all kind of around and make it co coerce, cohesion, coerce, co cohesive, cohesive, make it cohesive. So yeah, that is basically the crown. If you want some more in-depth looks on it, um, I have several images of work in progress images on my Facebook uh, album, Anastasia, if you want to check them out, go over there. Uh, last thing I want to talk about really quick is the jewelry. The jewelry is all handmade by me. I have a choker, a bracelet, and a ring, and they're all made with store-bought um, jewelry pieces from Joann's that are held together by Stretch Magic, which is like a stretchy plastic uh, jewelry wire that you can get at all kinds of craft stores and just held together with a regular um, twist clamp on the back of the choker and uh, bracelet. And the ring is on a ring base and it's all with these pieces. I do wear earrings with this also and it's this piece on an earring base. Oh, that was a lot to explain. Huh. Go ahead. I made this outfit for specifically for the Crown Cosplay cha Crown Championships of Cosplay 2017 year at C2E2, and I was actually honored to be placed as the Midwest champion with this outfit. I can't believe it happened. Did not expect that, but really, six months of that work really did pay off. Thank you, Anastasia. And that's the breakdown of my Anastasia outfit. Like I said, it was six months of work, and it really did pay off. This thing was a dream to make. I did struggle through it. I had problems like any outfit. So if you want to know more about my journey, please check out my website, JediAmanda.com. I have a full blog post on how I made this. Thank you for joining on this week's episode of Cosplay Breakdown. The next episode I'm probably going to have is my Queen of Madala outfits. Yes, that is plural because I've made two. So please stay tuned for the next Cosplay Breakdown outfit from me. If you don't already, like and subscribe to my channel, and share this video with all the other Anastasia friends in your life. I'm sure they'd love to see this beaded goddess mess. <laughs> and until next time, adios!